Here we are at the end of Unit 5, Heredity. This is the final video of the series. This is covering Units 5.5 and 5.6 of the AP Curriculum, which is Environmental Effects of Phenotype and Chromosomal Inheritance. So let's start with Environmental Effects of Phenotype. As a reminder from the uh, introduction of this unit, a uh, phenotype or differences in phenotype can be due to differences in the genotype, differences in the environment, or to a combination of genes and environment. Earlier in this unit, we primarily focused on the variation due to genes, um, whereas most commonly phenotypic variation is due to an interaction between genes and environment, and this video is where we're going to dig into that a little bit. So one example of a phenotype that is influenced, as the in, in, influenced by the environment is hydrangea. So you can notice that hydrangea comes in two different colors, and um, the difference in coloration comes from the type of soil and the soil pH. Um, so in the case of the pink soil, that's where we have alkaline or um, basic, and in the case of the blue, that's where we have very acidic soil, where it's, um, it ends up as a blue color. As a review, what would be the pH range of something basic versus something acidic? So things that are basic are bigger numbers than 7, and things that are acidic are smaller numbers than 7, where 7 is neutral. So this is an example of phenotypic plasticity. What is phenotypic plasticity, and what would be a human trait that shows phenotypic plasticity? And as a follow-up, what is a fitness advantage of phenotypic plasticity? So plasticity means sort of bendable or changeable, and phenotype is, remember, anything having to do with anatomy, physiology, behavior, so sort of the outward expression of the genotype and environment or combination. So phenotypic plasticity is where there's variation in the phenotype, um, and what that means is based on a certain genotype, there can be a range of phenotypes. Um, there are many, many human traits that show phenotypic plasticity. Um, one that we will talk about a bit later in this video is height. What's a fitness advantage of phenotypic plasticity? Um, well, one example would be that in different environments, you might end up with different phenotypes that are better suited for that environment. So even with a single genotype, you can get a better phenotype to environment match if there's phenotypic plasticity. So as I mentioned, height is something um, that is variable in humans. Um, and the question I have for you right now is, is height heritable? Um, and so I want you to design a study to test that. There would certainly be lots of ways of testing this, um, but I want you to take a look at the experimental design implied in these graphs. So take a look at these graphs and describe the study that may have been used to collect the data. Which of these two graphs do you think is more reflective of height and why? And as follow-up questions, how could we measure the heritability of height using our class? Um, and I want you to note that heritability of height is not often done using t data on teenagers, and maybe think about why that is. So one way to measure heritability of height is to compare the offspring phenotype and the parent phenotype, or the biological parent phenotype. Um, and so if we um, took data on um, student height and compared that to biological parent height, and we see if there's a correlation. In general, the better the correlation, the more the phenotypic um, range is due to a difference in genetics. If there's a range of phenotype, a range of heights, that is not correlated with parent height, then it might be environmental. Now, there are flaws in this study, right, because um, there's a possibility that parents and offspring share some sort of environment, that um, that environment influences height. So this isn't perfect, um, but this is a, a common way of sort of doing a first pass and look at looking at heritability. One of the reasons heritability of height is not often done using data on teenagers is because teenagers are at different stages of um, growth where before or during or after puberty, height can change dramatically in just a short period of time. So um, it's actually more likely to be done on um, younger children that are all more sort of consistent in their stage of development. All right, the next topic I want to talk about is called epigenetics. So epigenetics is the study of changes in organisms caused by modification of gene expression rather than alter alteration of the genetic code itself. So just as a sort of overview of what we're talking about here, if you look at the picture in the center, 
DNA in that double helix is made up of a series of nucleotides. Um, those um, nucleotides are somewhat represented here by those sort of red lines, um, would be the, the connection of two nucleotides across the center here. Um, but a chromosome is not just made of DNA. It's also made of some proteins called histones. And DNA wraps around those proteins um, in part to um, make sure it doesn't get all crinkled up and knotted and just a mess. It helps organize it. But it also helps control which genes are available for expression. So if you take a look at the diagrams on the right, there are um, two types of um, sort of chemical alteration that can happen to a chromosome to um, control gene expression. One is called DNA methylation. And if you remember back to functional groups, a methyl group is CH3. So if a methyl group is added to the DNA, that does something. Or if an acetyl group, and there's also an acetyl group pictured there, um, if that is added to the histone, that does something. See if you can figure out from these diagrams what DNA methylation does and what histone acetylation does. So DNA methylation generally causes the DNA to become more tightly coiled. If it's more tightly coiled, then the genes will not be available to be transcribed. So you won't get the gene products from them. So you can see that there's a gene of interest sort of highlighted in red. And when it's methylated, when that area is methylated, it's not accessible. So if the DNA is inaccessible, that gene is inactive. As opposed to histone acetylation, which generally makes that area of DNA looser, sort of unwound a bit, and that makes the DNA accessible, which uh, makes the gene available for transcription. Now, there are other factors that go into play of deciding whether or not a gene is activated, and we'll get into that in um, Unit 6. Um, but DNA methylation, histone acetylation do have something to do with this process. So one of the interesting things about epigenetic effects is that these can actually be inherited. So changes that are due to the environment can affect your uh, DNA coiling, methylation, acetylation, but then that information of which regions should be methylated, which regions should be acetylated, um, that goes um, sometimes onto the offspring. So this is a really interesting, this is relatively recent findings, there's a constant uh, new research in this field of looking at a different kind of heritability. So not just in the order of nucleotides in the DNA, but also these epigenetic effects. So the environment that your grandparents uh, experienced might affect which of your genes are activated. All right, moving on to unit 5.6 in chromosomal inheritance, let's look at nuclear versus non-nuclear inheritance. So if you look over on the left, you can see that there is DNA in a lot of different areas of the cell, not just in the, D in the nucleus. So when we usually think about DNA, we think about DNA in the nucleus, and that is where most of our DNA is. But there's also DNA in our mitochondria, and there is also DNA in the chloroplasts of organisms that have chloroplasts. Want to do a little bit of review here. How does DNA show support for the endosymbiont theory? And how does DNA show support for common ancestry? So as a reminder, the endosymbiosis or endosymbiont theory is that mitochondria and chloroplasts each retain their own DNA, and that supports that they originated as prokaryotic cells engulfed by host cells. So the theory of where eukaryotic cells came from is that they were prokaryotic cells um, that then were engulfed, and the fact that they have their own DNA still is evidence uh, supporting that theory. Thinking about DNA as such a, um, as such a common language, not just across humans, not just across mammals, but across all of life. This is a, the presence of a universal genetic code, um, of DNA and also RNA, um, shows that there is a common ancestry. Something else to take a look at on this diagram um, is to realize that nuclear DNA is inherited from all ancestors, whereas mitochondrial DNA is generally inherited on the um, matrilineal side, so from the mother. So if you notice, it's females passing on that information. So um, all humans generally get their mitochondrial DNA 
from their mothers. Um, and so this is a really useful uh, tool to be able to sort of track ancestry uh, through mitochondrial DNA. Um, there are, though, of course, um, exceptions to this rule. There are um, some interesting findings where there um, can be some mitochondrial DNA passed along um, male lines, but it's much, much less common. So we will just sort of go with the basics, the, the general rule. Mitochondrial DNA generally comes from the mother. All right, the last topic in this, um, this section is uh, non-disjunction. So non-disjunction is an error in meiosis or mitosis in which members of a pair of homologous chromosomes or sister chromatids uh, fail to separate properly from each other. It says fair there, but that should say fail. Fail to separate properly from each other. So the questions I have for you is what gametes will result if a 2N cell undergoes non-disjunction during meiosis 1? Notice I'm not saying 2N equals anything, because this is just a more general question. So a cell that is just a diploid in general, what if that undergoes non-disjunction during meiosis 1? And what happens uh, to the gametes if a 2N cell, a general 2N cell, undergoes non-disjunction during meiosis 2? So you can see the beginning of this diagram uh, showing non-disjunction in meiosis 1 on the left and showing non-disjunction in meiosis 2 on the right. So what will the resulting gametes be? So if non-disjunction occurs in meiosis 1, you will get half of the gametes with one extra chromosome, and you will get half of the gametes with one too few chromosomes. So we symbolize this as n plus 1 or n minus 1. If there's non-disjunction in the later division step, in meiosis 2, only half of the gametes will be affected. And that's because it happened in a later stage, so only half of these gametes are going to be affected. So we'll have one gamete that's n plus 1, one gamete that's n minus 1, and the other two gametes will be um, unaffected. They'll both be n, as you would expect if non-disjunction did not occur. So non-disjunction is, um, is the cause of Down syndrome. Down syndrome is also called trisomy 21, and Down syndrome results from an extra copy of chromosome number 21. Um, this is one of the most commonly occurring chromosomal conditions. Um, and Down syndrome, um, we're going to read an article about this and have a discussion in class, but just as a very basic, um, people with Down syndrome experience cognitive delays. The effect is usually mild to moderate and is not indicative of the many strengths and talents that each individual possesses. So we're going to do um, uh, read an article about um, sort of a, a interesting bioethical debate about um, sort of choosing to selectively abort if it's showing that the child is uh, or the um, fetus is at increased risk for Down syndrome. And so I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that there's a right answer here or a wrong answer, but it certainly is where sort of biology meets some really interesting ethical questions. And so we're going to investigate those in class. So this quote that you see here is from um, the website of Club 21. This is an organization in Pasadena that helps support um, families with um, a child who um, has Down syndrome. All right, so we're going to leave it there for today, and that's the end of Unit 5. And um, we will continue on this video series in Unit 6. We'll look at gene expression.